I'm just getting my images up on the screen as well. So, um, how how did you find Flatome last week? Don't 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 go quiet on me. Has Goff gone? Has Goff gone? Goff. His name's gone. Where's he gone? Aliens. Where's he gone? What the hell? He was there and then he isn't. Is this something I said? I, I, I mentioned it. Probably. Probably you mentioned flat home and that was it. Maybe he had a bad experience on flat home. Oh, for God's sake. A bad experience on flat home? Oh, God, we've got to bloody wait for him now. Uh... You are my, no, no, you actually just sounded like that bloody Jimmy Savile. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that, I gotta be honest with you, right? That was really bad. <laughs> just don't do that again. <laughs> um, does this mean now we get Keith back? I can, not Keith. Oh, my God. I'm getting everyone's names wrong. There's only two of you. There was only two. Now there's one. Like the ten little soldier boys. Oh, for God's sake! Where is he? Where's he gone? Oh my God! Oh, give him a phone call. Give him a phone I call. I gotta give him a phone call. Yeah, where? Mm. Goff, where are? Goff, where are you? He's only a couple of miles away from me, so he should be there. Goff, where are you? Is he not trying? To, he's not trying to get back in, is he? No. I'm gonna say I upset him. Mm. Well, my bloody camera's not working now. Goff's not working at all. Oh, my fucking God. What a bloody disaster. Yeah. It's the end of life as we know it. Do you know, do you know I, I, I completely believe it's the, it's the end of life as we know it. You know, we're, we're just... Uh, we're, we've, we've been waiting for... Yeah. He's what? back. I'm back. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, what I, what I asked, right... <laughs> Well, I asked. I, I, now, if this happens again, Keith, it's, it, there's a reason for it, right? Yeah. What yeah. I asked was, uh, was what did you think of Flatome last week? Flatome? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Oh God, because I, I because I thought it was one of those words that you you mention it and and just like you disappear. Yeah, it was okay. Okay. Good. Fine. 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 Good idea. He's done it before, though. Oh, um, what? My God. When, when did he... What? What? He did it live? He, did, he came to the class once, didn't he, when you couldn't make it? I'm not sure. Time. I know he's done... He's, he's, yeah. Uh, Years yeah. ago. I thought, but no, he was, he was very interesting, yeah. He, he, no he problem. Told, he, he, told me, he told me you hadn't heard it before. Did he? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I didn't want to say to be rude to anything. Oh, God! <laughs> well, you, 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 you could, you could have been, you could have been rude to him, I guess, and just. Well, um... he shouldn't give up his day job. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, for fuck! I, 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 I don't know what to say. Right. Okay. Okay. We're going to record now. So. <laughs> Uh, any, any, anyway, by the way, Keith, any news from you this week? No, no, other than I've got a blinking cold. No, apart from that, everything's fine and dandy. Is that why you haven't turned up? In, in um... Yeah, yeah, because I didn't want to. I don't want to be sneezing and coughing all over everybody just in case. All right. What about you, Goff? Any news from you, darling? No, I'm, I'm not any news at all. No. Oh, okay, okay. So I, we're gonna we're gonna look at a topic that is sort of close to the heart and, and sort of close to the bone, really. It, it's involving this wall behind me. Um, and it's involving the archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon. Now, Kathleen Kenyon is one of those one of those archaeologists in um, in in the history of archaeology that that seems to have made a major impact. And um, sort of the one thing that we can say about Kathleen Kenyon is that she's described as one of the most influential archaeologists um in the history of archaeology i would like to make that uh, statement she's the most one of the most influential archaeologists in archaeology ever right yeah. but but that that would be that would be very very disrespectful because she's she's a very uh, respected eminent archaeologist 
And the site that we're going to actually look at is this one, Jericho. Now, I'm not going to talk about the whys and way for alls of Jericho and whether the walls crumbled because the Ark of the Covenant, that's the Ark of the Covenant down there, was yeah. placed at the walls of Jericho and, and, and the trumpet sounded and the walls collapsed. Don't but but there is some truth in that because um, we, we've got archaeological evidence to say that the walls of Jericho were probably rebuilt maybe up to two dozen times over the wall's history, which is a history of a wall that goes on for nearly 11,000 years. So maybe, maybe, I've, maybe I've given a little bit too much information there because I've taken this away from Kathleen Kenyon. However, there is Kathleen Kenyon herself, and she, she's very much on, in the beginnings of a new wave of archaeology, a new wave of archaeologists, and it's those it's those new archaeologists that are looking at frontiers that archaeology is not dared to look at before. So uh, we're looking at the likes of Jericho, archaeology in the Middle East, and she's working with some of the greats of archaeology as well. So I'm going to I'm going to try and place this as it needs to be. This this great wall in front of you, and I'm just going to. Uh, let the cat out of the bag. So go on in. Go on in, cat. Uh, this, this is the famous image of one of the towers at Jericho. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's still there. You can still see it. Uh, the, the depth of the archaeology at Jericho has been excavated to over 20 meters in depth. So you're thinking that there's layer and layer and layer and layer and layer. Stop! Layer of archaeology. And this is basically what we're looking at. Um, and Kathleen Kenyon was one of those that devised a, a new way of analyzing biblical archaeology, real archaeology, <coughs> um, and being within the frontier of the new archaeology of the Middle East. Um, and... Kathleen Kenyon, if we give her a little bit of an introduction, was one of those archaeologists who wasn't afraid to say that something wasn't right or something uh, wasn't wrong in archaeology. So she actually shares the same birthday of somebody in the room, the 5th of January. And that's, the, that's my birthday. So she was born on the 5th of January, 1906. All great eminent archaeologists are born on the 5th of January, if yeah, I so, may say so myself. So Jeff Keith. Old goat. Yeah, she's an old goat. Oh, no, no, no. I told Jessica, don't say anything disrespectful about Kathleen Kenyon because she is on the frontier. Dame Kathleen Kenyon. And she died, if we want to give dates, she, lived, she was born in 1906 and she died on the 24th of August, 1978. Uh, which is quite appropriate. That's going to be the anniversary of the eruption of um, the volcano at Vesuvius. So that's that's quite appropriate. And she was still working as as she's she's still there working in archaeology in, in the very last days. Um, British archaeologist, naturally, she's work very much a Neolithic expert, but she she does a lot of Roman stuff as well. And she excavates on a site that is basically the site of ancient Jericho, or a place known as Tel Er Sultan. And Tel, basically the mound of the Sultan. That's what basically that means, the, 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 the mound of the eminent Sultan at Jericho itself. And she's excavating there from the early 1950s. She becomes the bee's knees from 1952 to 1958. And the work that she gave us, the, the, the information that she gave us from the archaeology is still being looked at today. And in fact, I don't know if you can remember, some time ago, we looked at an article that looked at the bones from the excavation. We, we had um, bones that were in boxes in, in Sydney University. And in the 1970s, they, they were looking into these boxes and they actually worked out that, that, that they, could, they could work out the, the, when, when there was no such thing as TB and leprosy. And then suddenly you've got TB and leprosy. And these bones were being found at Jericho. And, 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 and basically, if, if, I will go into detail about this, but the one thing about these bones 
is that they told you the start of of leprosy and the start of TB. It, it you know basically one moment you don't have something and the next moment you do have something and as you can learn why this is you can see why this is because because of these this this great city at Jericho it, it came from nowhere it, it it one minute that was not there and the next minute it was there a few years later you don't have these diseases the next thing you do have these de diseases it all sort of uh, it, it it all fits in really nicely and she was one of those that um, never said no to doing archaeology um, she was always going to do archaeology for example she was the eldest daughter of a chap by the name of Sir Frederick Kenyon, who was a biblical scholar and later director of the British Museum. So she was there. She was she was the artifacts and everything were in front of her. She would go with her father to the British Museum and she would be able to look into these cabinets. And, um, and basically, she ended up um, then going to university. She ended up going to Oxford um she she would be, become very well educated alongside the sister in later years kathleen kenyon would remark that her father's position at the british museum was particularly helpful for education well it would be oh, yeah. um, can you imagine you, 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 she's going into the museum and there's all these mummies and all these all these things everywhere and she's able to look at them and and and, and really understand and, and get to grips and it, it this is the thing with with I can remember when I was a child, just little things in archaeology, just going to museums and seeing these things and seeing these places, and and she become um, overawed by by the archaeology. So she's many firsts. Makes not sound relevant to you, any of you, but uh, the first female president of the Oxford University Archaeology Society, which was quite an eminent thing. And in 1929, she graduated, and she ended up working with another female archaeologist in 1929 at Great Zimbabwe at the site um, that Gertrude Cato Thompson would rewrite history. Gertrude, this is another archaeologist, Gertrude Cato Thompson. She was the archaeologist who said that Great Zimbabwe and Mapa Wage uh, in South Africa and Zimbabwe itself, she was the one that said that this archaeology, the information in the ground, this is Kathleen, uh, this is... Um, Gertrude Cato Thompson saying this, she, she was saying, actually, this is not constructed by people from the West. This is constructed by people from Africa. And people thought, oh, my God, that you can't say that. You can't say that. And Kathleen Kenyon took that on board. And then she copied Gertrude Cato Thompson and said, actually, black is black and white is white. It's not what the male archaeologists are saying. I'm going to challenge what the male archaeologists are saying in the Middle East. And that's exactly what she did. So in other words, it's these pioneers of archaeology who are, who are rewriting history as it should be written. Challenging male archaeologists. And there's a really important point to be made here. The male archaeologists are obsessed with war and they're obsessed with killing and they're obsessed with swords and they're obsessed with uh, religion are obsessed with ritual female archaeologists come in and saying actually, actually you know other people other people lived in these societies children lived in these societies elderly people lived in these societies females lived in these societies and 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 this the, and then after leaving uh, south africa she joined another leading eminent archaeologist sir mortimer wheeler who was in fact so Mortimer Wheeler was, in fact, accompanied by his wife, Lady Wheeler, who was also an, a, an archaeologist, Tessa Wheeler. Tessa Wheeler was also an archaeologist working with her husband, Sir Mortimer Wheeler. That's another thing. Lots of lots of very eminent archaeologists at the time. Flinders Petrie, for one, also had his wife, who was also an archaeologist. OK, and we, 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 we do see that as being what's happening archaeology is developing and I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna shout and say oh you know you know women's lib and all the rest of it what happens now is that archaeology becomes balanced it's not just a male dominated profession it's now a profession that that equals people's ideas of the past right 
without saying any female word, it equals, everything starts to equal out. So there's an equal understanding of the past. And this archaeologist that we're talking about, Kathleen Kenyon, when we look at her work at Jericho, and actually we're looking at Jericho itself, but you can't look at the excavations at Jericho without looking at this lady. So she's excavating at um, the likes of Berylanium, St. Albans. And I was actually doing St. Albans yesterday in my Roman lecture, uh, which I still do on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, and she was um, she was working on the excavations at St. Albans, Albans with um, Tessa Wheeler and um, Sir Mortimer Wheeler. Um, and she learned from Sir Mortimer Wheeler the meticulous ways that archaeology should be undertaken. Rules. Um, the, the grid square, square excavation method that you would box everything up into squares and you'd have little bulks in between them and you'd be able to read the stratigraphy. Right? And this was very important. The very important thing was that being able to read the stratigraphy from the sides of the trench and then read the stratigraphy as you're going down, which is very, very important. And then very early age, um, in 1935, I think actually a little bit before, she, she started directing archaeological excavations at Verilanium, a female archaeologist directing archaeological excavations in the 1950s. Also, we've got Tessa Wheeler as well, so she's excavating. And then she ends up in Palestine. So she's excavating in Palestine. And one thing that she works works out in Palestine are a site known as Samaria, Samaria, S-A-M-A-R-I-A, -A -A, Samaria, not Samaria, but Samaria. Samaria is going to be uh, in the um, the likes of Ur and Babylon and the, and the U U Euphrates and, and the Tigris, all that there. Samaria is actually um, just above the area and within the area of Jerusalem. So she's excavating there. And, and the wonderful thing is with British archaeologists and French, French archaeologists back then is that the French and the British control that part of the Middle East. They control Jerusalem, Jordan, Israel, Syria. They, they control all of that. So it means that archaeologists like her can safely excavate within that landscape. She can, she can, she can, she can find a fish. She can excavate within that landscape, and that's exactly what she's doing in the 1930s. While she's working with the likes of the Wheelers at Verulamium, she, she's there. Then she goes out more or less permanently working there, um, and then she comes back to Britain. And she's then doing a little bit of Roman archaeology at the Jewry Walls in Leicester. So she's getting real great experience with excavations in Leicester and um, the Middle East and Palestine. She's all over the place. And then eventually she starts digging in Jericho. And if you've worked out, she's over here in, um, working at Leicester in 1939. The war starts. Um, and like many archaeologists, um, we, we've got to do a decent job and a real job. Um, we've got to, um, Kathleen Kenyon ended up serving um, as a commander in the, in the Red Cross, a divisional commander in the Red Cross. But naturally, she can't let the archaeology go. So she's working at the Institute of Archaeology. And eventually, um, after the war, she ends up going to Libya and she ends up going to this amazing site at the West Bank, this site of Tel S. Sultan which has got all those layers. It's a tell. So you, 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 you rem and you've got all these layers, layer after layer after layer over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But one thing, one thing that she realizes at, with the excavations at Jericho is that the archaeology is very, very old. It, it's in fact older than the most archaeological sites in the country, in, in the world. It, it's, 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 it's suddenly, as I said um, a little while ago, I said that, her excavations looking at Jericho um, took the understanding of the history of archaeology back beyond anything that we could ever imagine. In fact, <clears throat> the first wall being built at Jericho was maybe up to 11,000 years ago. A first proper stone built wall around Jericho 11,000 years ago. And why is that so significant? We don't have anything like that in Britain for for thousands and thousands of years. So we don't have anything like those stone walls in Britain, right, until about 3,000 years ago. So the landscape of Jerusalem, Jericho, um, that, that world 
that that early really neolithic settlement that that really early stuff that that groundbreaking work that she's been doing sets this aside as being one of the one of the real early pieces of evidence that tells us a great deal about where we are today um so she was she was then very much interested in trying to see the archaeology and whether the archaeology can prove or disprove the bible and you know what she started to realize that there, that there were bits of wall at certain stages at Jericho that had collapsed and the people from the pe people from biblical archaeology comes along and says actually that's evidence that the that, that, that trumpets were played at the walls of Jericho and the walls of Jericho collapsed and she said well it is it is sort of evidence you know it, it is sort of and it then sets Jericho as well with the other stories of the Bible for example she ends up working in Jerusalem um, and she worked at the Temple Mount and almost as she was working, the, the, the evidence of the Bible started to um, occur. She wasn't proving that the Bible was a reality. It happened to be that lots of the sites that she was working at proved some of the stories in the Old Testament. Um, and that is, is very, very important. Very, very important. So, so. So Kathleen Kenyon, she's she she is up there as 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 being the one um, that we we can learn a great deal from. So anyway, before Goff says it, let's have a look at a little bit more look at these images. Um, so there there is Jericho. You've got um, the Sea of Galilee. You've got the Dead Sea. Um, you've got the River Jordan between the uh, um, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. You've got this sort of old map of Judea. You've got this, the area of, of Samaria there. So you've got the city of Samaria there, more or less in the middle. You've got Jericho. Um, and this is what we're talking about, this sort of old ancient world that is almost as if the archaeology fits in. Uh, the, it's almost as if the Bible fits in with the archaeology, not the archaeology fitting in with the Bible, uh, which is which is really key to where we go. Um, so she is a good looker. And, and why not? All archaeologists are good lookers, as you as you well know. Some. Sure. Um, and let's 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 say a little bit more about Kathleen Kenyon bef before we look at the archaeological excavations, right? Um, it, it just just a few statements. Um, here we go. This this is this is about Kathleen Kenyon's legacy. Kenyon did not capitalize fully on the implications of a stratigraphic techniques by producing final productions promptly. Indeed, a method of digging, which most of us have subsequently adopted, that's quite important, causes a proliferation of loci that excavators often have difficulty keeping straight long enough to produce coherent published stratigraphic synthesis. So in other words, the layers that she was recording, she was recording them. Um, moreover, insistence that excavation proceed in narrow trenches denies us when we use the Jericho reports, the confidence that her loci and the pottery assemblages that go with them represent understandable human activity patterns over coherently connected living areas. The individual layers insufficiently exposed horizontally simply cannot be interpreted credibly in terms of function. However, what we do see is that she's able to then put this all together and we're able to read the layers through the trenches and be able to understand those layers, giving us a positive legacy. And we all read those layers in archaeology to understand how archaeology works. So in other words, she wasn't she wasn't um, going out there quickly producing the publications. She was having those narrow trenches, which most archaeologists don't use. But in those narrow trenches, she was recording every single individual layer. And then the, every single one of those individuals la layers was able to read the archaeology like a book, which mo most archaeologists struggle to do. Because in most archaeology, what we do, we, we, we excavate a whole area and we try to put everything together. 
Um, and hopefully that's going to be enough. What Kathleen Kenyon was doing, she was putting a trench here and a trench here and working out that that layer is very similar there to that layer there and that layer there and that layer there. And she was able to go down like pages in a book and able to read it. And she was able um, that um, she was able to give us the information that we needed over time. And this, this was basically a legacy. And she produced book after book after book uh, about archaeology. And in fact, one, one of the, the, she's got such an amazing list of books. If anyone's interested in, in her work, the, the book to look at is Digging Up Jericho, 1957. You can pick up a penguin um, copy off Amazon. And that, that book itself is the type of book that you can you can get and read and it, it just gives you an idea of her work. And um, she's still publishing books um, in 1978, The Bible and Recent Archaeology in the Year of Her Death. Mm. So, so she keeps going and what we need to do is look at what the work of Jericho actually means. So let's have, have, have a look at some of these images. Um, so there we go, Jericho, Samaria, there, there's the, the city of Samaria, all of these places in the Bible, Galilee, Judea, you've got Cana, you've got the likes of the Sea of Galilee, you've got the River Jordan, you've got the um, Dead Sea, Mount Nebo, for example, all, the, all these places that we, that we hear about in, in, in the Bible, Jobah, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, Masada, it's all there. Um, you know, we, we've mentioned Masada, you know, the, the siege at Masada, where where the Romans besieged the Jews at Masada in, in I think it was about 74, um, 74 AD. Um, and then what we do find is if you go to the site today, some of the deep excavations are still there to see. And 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 that there is that there is where the tower is. So that person is actually looking down at the tower, all these layers. 20, 20 meters of layers of archaeology and Kathleen Kenyon recording those layers. Um, so, Annie, let's have a little look. So, Jericho town located in the West Bank, Jericho, is one of the earliest continuous settlements in the world, dating perhaps from 900 year, 9,000 years BC. Well, actually, 9,000 years BC, 11,000 years ago. So, so, so. 11,000 years ago, what does that mean to us in, in Britain? Well, 11,000 years ago to us in Britain means that we were just coming out of the Ice Age. In Britain, we were just starting to fell trees. In Britain, we didn't have permanent settlements. In Britain, it would be thousands of years before we start building the likes of Stonehenge. Uh, roughly, we start thinking about Stonehenge about 5,000 years ago, or just, just, just before that, right? Was um, about 5,500 years ago, we're building things like Tinkins with Burial Chamber and St. Lytham's and West Kennet Long Barrow, right? But this site itself at Jericho isn't 5,000 years ago, it's 11,000 years ago. That's a difference of 6,000 years. So double the time span that we're starting to do big things in this country, massive things have occurred that time span, 6,000 years before. So in other words, when we're starting to do things in Britain on a big scale, history has already played itself out to the length of time that we take from Stonehenge all the way through to the modern day. Archaeological excavations demonstrated Jericho's lengthy history and world history, world history in the world archaeological context. The city site is of great archaeological importance. It's, it's one of the you know, I'm going to say this in the right context, is one of the, the greatest archaeological excavations ever. And this is not that sort of ever, you know, this is ever. This, this, this is the one to really learn from. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm saying look at the publications, you know. It provides evidence of the first development of permanent settlements and thus are the first steps towards civilization. The difference is, folks, the, the big difference is is that whenever we look at archaeology in Great Britain, this isn't anti Leonard Cottrell's idea that, you know, we've got archaeology at home and, you know, we, we've got, um, uh, we ignore it at home. I'm not, I'm not dissing archaeology at home because naturally I, all the archaeological sites I work on are here, right, in Britain, um, except I've worked abroad on a couple of occasions. But any, anyway, the point is, 
is that to understand our archaeology, we've got to go to places like this, you know, um, the cradles of civilization, the cradles of how things were done. Um, and not that everything starts from Jericho, because humanity has demonstrated the following. Wherever you've got humanity, we will develop as a, and we will develop the civilizations in complete isolation eventually. Right? As we saw with Easter Island, we will see civilization developing in, in South America, in the tropical rainforest, in the Terra Preta, in complete isolation, without any influence from the likes of Jericho. But the point I'm trying to make is that we see how, how the human mind works. So we see how the human mind works at Jericho. That's the same human mind that works elsewhere. And we can see how it works because we've got all the steps to see how humanity develops in complete isolation in different parts of the world. Because the human mind is the same wherever it goes. We are very curious. We want to develop. So, for example, the, the great, it's, it's called determinism, not diffusionism, that everything comes from Egypt or everything comes from Africa or China or what have you, right? It's called determinism, right? With determinism. And what that basically means is this. Um, yesterday, yesterday, for example, uh, I, I looked at um, the, the Romans. Hang on a minute. Let's... Uh, Let's get a Jericho uh, image. We, we looked at the, the Romans um, in the, the, the Roman um, rebellion of Boudicca. Boudicca. We looked at Boudicca yesterday, um, you know, 60, 61 AD, that around there. Um, and one of, one of the things that I, I was discussing was that Emperor Nero um, decided that if the Roman army was going to be defeated again by Boudicca, he was going to pull. He was going to pull out of Britain, um, which would have been quite a sensible move because you know he would have he would have saved what was left of the Roman army, and um, he, he was going to say, right, let just pack up and go before this gets any worse. Nero sounds like a real nut job occasionally, but he was actually quite a sensible general when it came. Central commander, he wasn't a general. Sens sensible commander, he, he, an emperor. He, he thought, right. What we're going to do, we're going to we're going to pull out. If if this happens again, we're going to pull out. A bit like the British Army um, um, when we ran away on, on the beaches of Dunkirk. Um, the 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 uh, we just, the, the British government decided that we were going to save that army. Um, we weren't going to fight anymore. We're going to save that army, bring it back, re 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 kit it, and then we we're going to use that army refreshed against the Germans. And that actually was a strategy that worked. It worked. Right. And Nero was going to do the same thing with Britain, except the Roman army got the uh, upper hand with Boudicca and that was it. And the Romans stayed here and um, and basically remained. And that was it. But the point I was trying to make was that if Nero had pulled out the troops and it was no longer Roman Britain, the British would have developed into building towns and cities and all the rest of it eventually. Um, and even if the Romans hadn't invaded Britain in the first place in 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 56, 55 BC, the British would have developed towns and cities eventually, because that's what we would have done. We would have needed towns and cities. As more and more people get together, what do we do with them? We put them in towns and cities. That's what happened, and this is exactly what happened with Jericho. So by learning from Jericho, we can hope to understand how things would develop. But Jericho is, is very, very, is very, very different and very, very interesting. And what we do see, Kathleen Kenyon's excavations would have gone down over 21 meters. Now, I've, 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 the, the idea of excavating in these in these trenches like like this behind me, 21 meters. Now, <laughs> the height of this room is basically where are we looking. The height of this room is four meters. Right. I'm thinking, right, that's four meters. So if we put the floor above it, that's eight meters. Um, um, and then we put the roof on another four meters, that's 12 meters. So more or less, the depth of the excavations at Jericho are twice the height of my, of, of the, of my house. Mm. Um, I, she decided instead of excavating a whole area um, and using the uh, um, box square method that um, 
Sir Mortimer Wheeler was using um, beryllium and and the likes of uh, of of the Jewry Wall in, in Leicester and, the, and 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 the likes of um, Maiden Castle. She decided to excavate in these trenches. She tr she decided to dare and dream, and she was reading the layers as she went down. The layers were what was important, not getting to the archaeology. The layers were what was important, right? So all those all those twenty one meters of archaeology were were being read all the way down, all the way down to the bottom. And and what what we then see is what is important is that when she gets down when she gets down to the very lowest layer, the very lowest layer, what she finds traces of of Mesolithic hunters. And that evidence is being radiocarbon dated. She's got evidence of Mesolithic hunters, and that evidence is being radiocarbon dated. Yes, we do have radiocarbon dating when she's excavating at the site. I think the evidence that she's got is is kept and analysed probably in the 1960s. Will Adlibby's um, ground groundbreaking technique of radiocarbon dating able to date these layers? And as as we're able to date these layers, we're able to work out that the site. The Mesolithic site, the very early non sort of Neolithic revolutionary re re site, takes the site back to beyond 11,000 years ago. And then suddenly, 11,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, between 11,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, these people develop a settlement. They develop a set settlement, but by 10,000 years ago, they've built a massive wall around the site. These people haven't messed around. Ten thousand years ago, they're building walls, big, thick, bloody walls. You know, they, they've they've moved from Mesolithic hunters to developing a, a city. <clears throat> I know it may sound ridiculous. Within a thousand years, they 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 built a wall, right? But let's look at that in context. It took us six thousand years for us to build Stonehenge. It took us. It, it took these people to go from scrubbing around to um grubbing around to building houses to then building a community to then building a city overnight it is overnight it really is so by ten thousand years ago the inhabitants had grown into an organized community capable of building a massive stone wall around the settlement and what does that mean it means agriculture it means animal husbandry it means trade it means Communication, it means organization, it means disease. Sorry to put that one in there, but that's what that means. It's a, this means this means disease. Now, um, we then went off on a tangent on Tuesday evening, as I'm doing now. Um, basically, as you know, I've got long COVID. And um, and I was just thinking, oh, Christ, I'm not feeling well again today. But I'm, I'm okay now. Um, and... Um, and and I mentioned this on Tuesday. I said last week, the reason, you know, there were two, two main factors why I couldn't talk on Tuesday. And then when we went to West Wales on the weekend, I, I felt I felt well again. It was strange. I had fresh air. We were working in the fresh air. I was fine. I was well again. And, I, and, I, and I'm reminded then of this thing being around in towns and cities. Towns and cities suit some people, right? But it doesn't suit me and it doesn't suit my health. Right. And then I started to realize towns and cities are where you get diseases. Um, you get close approximations of people with diseases like Keith today. He didn't go along. He didn't go along to uh, the group in Lancet Major because um, if he sneezed and spluttered and all the rest of it, yeah. that would have made people ill. Right. So as towns and cities, all you need is one person who falls ill in a town and city from something that we don't rightly understand. And everyone falls ill. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. And, and it's the close approximation of animals and so on. And, and whether I'm right and wrong on what I'm about to say, if, if COVID came from nowhere, uh, which it certainly didn't, but if COVID came from nowhere, this is the this is the type of an analogy we're looking at, right? Because eventually diseases spread from animals to humans because animals are used to to being together, right? Herds of animals, that can't be good. You know, mulling around in their own shit day after day, right? Humans were living in open settlements, but then humans got together. They're now living in their own shit and diseases start to spread. Yep. Yeah, so what, what, what we do see is 
eventually we also see the settlements with towers 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 massive towers like this one behind me this is obviously um have been rebuilt time and time and memorial but the early evidence tells us that they're building massive towers like the one behind me um and this is this is a revolution this is this this, this revolution after revolution you is trying to say the importance of this but we take all this for granted right but i tell you what we wouldn't take it for granted if we were dumped in the middle of a field completely naked we would have to learn all these things again right and these people didn't learn these things again they learned these things from scratch there was no that there, there unless you're looking at um, von daniken there, there was no um where you've got aliens and all this nonsense right these people had no precedent and and the things that they were creating were the biggest things that were ever created by humanity at that time and would be the can you imagine this a, a tall tower um a tower like the one behind me with with a wall that's um four or five meters in height right these would be the highest things that these people would have ever seen. And then you've got a five meter tall wall and a six meter tall wall. And you've got a 10 meter tower and a 15 meter tower and all these things towering. These are the tallest things ever, ever that these people would have ever seen. Right. These are bigger than the pyramids. Oh, by the way, the pyramids wouldn't turn up for another um, pyramids being constructed 4,600 years um, ago. So the pyramids ain't going to turn up for another 7,000 years. This wall's been constructed. These towers are being constructed. Pyramid don't don't have an innings for thousands of years, right? Why they started to do this, I don't know. Why 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 would you why would you want these tall walls? Why would you want to do this? But but they did. It's not for me to wonder why. It's actually to do and die, and this is what they're doing. They're 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 um. That's a copyright issue there, isn't there? Um, what, 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 what there is, is that are they building these things for defense? Are they? The answer's got to be no. Why are they building them? I don't know. I don't have a time machine. But they're building these things. And then this, the other thing as well is, right, why are people moving together in settlements? Well, we've got, we think we know why. Are we right but the main the main thing is, well, is that they're building these things. They're capable of doing it, not to wonder why, but they, they're doing it. You know, um, I don't know why Goff attends these classes every week. Um, maybe Goff doesn't. But the fact of the matter is we don't really need answers to everything. We don't need answers to everything. And the size of this settlement justifies the use of the term town and suggests a population of some two to three thousand persons, um, which is slightly smaller than the population of, of Lanswick Major at this minute, which is about four thousand. But it's definitely um, pretty much up there. Thus, this one thousand, uh, what we do see within a thousand years, we'd, we'd, we'd taken the people from hunting way of life to full settlement with walls, everything. So what that must have mean, now this isn't me adding the dots together and actually coming up with a fluffy sort of animal, right? Um, the development, what this must have meant, how, how, how have you gone from a hunter-gatherer, small groups of people, to a full-blown settlement of thousands, right? How is that possible? But there's an answer to that. It must be because they've they've managed to work out. We managed to infer from this. We managed to work out that agriculture must be massive in their society. Um, but tell me I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Because there's an example of 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 a, of a civilization that did similar things to this, not on this scale, but similar things to this. The Yamon Yamon culture of Japan. We go back to the Yamon culture of Japan around the same time. And, and I remember doing that lecture. I remember saying, actually, even though they're building these great settlements and these great buildings and these walls and all these other things, right, they didn't actually go into cultivating uh, the likes of rice for many thousands of years. They were able to use what they had in their environment, trade and all the rest of it to feed themselves, right? They were able to be, they were able to continue to be hunters and gatherers because they, but, but Japan's different. It's got trees. It's got endless everything, right? <sighs> The Holy Land is a bit limited. It's, it's, it, 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 you know, 
yeah, the Holy Land may have had a couple more trees in the past than it does today. But after a while, there's only so much you can do with a couple of trees to feed a growing population. So it must mean that they managed to, they must, must mean that they managed to cultivate types of wheat and barley. Um, and some of this evidence has been eventually found. So they, they must have been very much reliant upon wheat and barley uh, and animal husbandry. And animal husbandry, as we, we know, brings its own perils. It, it, um, living in close proximation of animals does breed diseases, as, as we see in the 1300s. In the 1300s, we have, we have this great sort of temperature increase in Britain. And um, in the 1300s, we've got lots of cattle that we're living with, anthrax, um, spores, disease, um, making our population very weak when it's hit by the plague, bingo. So, you know, and the other thing as well is one thing that's completely missing. One, one, one thing that's absolutely massively missing um, is the fact that you can you you can have find you can get ergot from the likes of um, wheat and barley ergots is like a, a bacteria and um, um, that can be fatal so if you if you if you keep your um, your seeds damp and you don't dry them out enough um, then you can get horrible things from um, some of your crops so you know all this, all, all this is evidence of uh, the settlement is, is evidence. The city, the town is, is evidence of early agriculture. It is highly probable that to pro provide enough land for cultivation, irrigation had been invented. So we're, we're again, where you've got cultivation, you've got irrigation. There's a song there. Cultivation, irrigation, mm -hmm. cultivation is what we need. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So you've got irrigation yeah. and you've got cultivation. So the first Neolithic culture of Palestine was a purely indigenous development. So it all developed locally. There wasn't like great sort of aliens and stuff coming in and waves of people and all the rest of it telling them what to do. They managed to do it. They <coughs> sat down one day and they thought, right, okay, we're going to do this. And then, oh, by the way, that leads to this. How how how, how can we grow more crops? How, how do we do that? Hang on a minute. Um, ooh. Oh, God, I'm, I'm drinking liquid, yeah? I tell you what, if we if we if we manage to get the water from the River Jordan into the fields, we can grow more crops and we can not only have one crop growing in one year, we can have two crops growing. Um, and then the wastewater, you can have animals and all these other things. And, and then, oh, wow. Yeah. OK. So with more people, how, what do we do? Uh, well, we're going to have to put them all together in, in, in one area. Yeah. But what what about the, the waste from humans? Oh, well, um, as, as we learned from Chapel Hayek, you, you take their output in the fields. Uh, and all these things start to develop and your mind starts to go and it starts to think, 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 think. I'm not thinking like, I'm not thinking like, um, I, I'm not thinking like a modern human to put myself back into this age. So, so for example, um, a few, a few, a few weeks ago where we went to, um, West Wales and, and, and the land that I keep mentioning in West Wales, um, and we went there and I, and, and I said to Michelle, I said, I've got to build a house. <coughs> and I said, I've never built a house before in my life. And now um, um, I basically thought, right, OK, what we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll put a few posts and we'll get it level. We'll put some crete in there. And I built a little miniature house for the goats. I've, 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 never, built a, I've never built a little miniature house before, but I built it. Um, it, it's standing. It's all level. There's, 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 and it's waterproof. Brilliant. I did that. I know, I know, I know what a house looks like because I live, live in one, right? But if you're pushed and you've got the materials, you can do anything. You, human beings can do absolutely anything, and we can go to the moon or Mars if we so wish. So, okay. Um, so it'd be, be good to sort of uh, look, look a little bit more of the, about these images, to be honest with you. So Kathleen Kenyon looking at her work at Jericho as uh, the archaeology at Jericho um, continues. And there she is as the dame herself in the 1970s. And she's a hands-on archaeologist. She's, she's an archaeologist that likes to get herself mucky and muddy and actually she's she's in the storeroom thinking oh my god we're surrounded by all these artifacts but all these artifacts have meaning they're from different layers and th this all has has a sense so what what she's done instead of instead of saying oh you know the seriation method developed by flinders petrie i remember we did seriation where you start off with a mug and then you've got 
a handle and you've got decoration and it gets a bigger um, and there are two handles um, and there's a bit difference in the rim. Well, that's called development. That's called seriation. So the stuff, the stuff with a handle is going to be in a higher level than the stuff without a handle. That's called seriation. But what, what, what this lady did, what this, what this dame did, she basically took that onto another level. She said, there's got to be more to those layers. There's got to be more things in those layers to actually be able to date those layers oh, the before radiocarbon oh. dating. What's that strange noise in the background from Keith? It wasn't me. It wasn't me? It was the aliens. Yeah, shut up, you. Um, and there she is in 1977. <coughs> and I tell you what, I wouldn't mess with her. Christ. Yeah, I wouldn't meet her down at the dark alley. So, um, so, so Kathleen Kenyon was working into her very, very last days. Very, very respected. I very much respect her. She's, she's, she's up there in archaeology. And there she is at, at the bottom there, looking at some of the uh, mud bricks for some of these buildings, the, the excavations at Jericho. Um, and there it is, Jericho, the West Bank. It's, it's not the place to be working today, to be honest with you. Um, with all the uh, problems in the West um, Bank um, and the Gaza Strip, it's probably not the best place to be working for a Western archaeologist at this minute. But she worked there when she had an opportunity to do so. She worked there when the British and the French controlled the landscape. She she worked there when when it was fit to do so. And you know she she was basically um, she was doing something that that I would never be able to do today. Even though I've got the skills to do it and and the knowledge to do it, I wouldn't be able to do it because I'm not a, I'm, I'm not you know I I. I, I I'm not the right type of person to be doing it. Um, so what, what we've got, we've got these very deep trenches that you can actually see here. So she's excavating these very deep trenches. Uh, she didn't excavate all the site. She actually excavated set areas of the site to take. This is a tell. This, this is a mounded site. And over time, you've got layer after layer. You've got one building above another building and above another building. Yeah, this is what we're talking about with various walls. It's not it's not a massively set out settlement, but never that nevertheless it's got the importance of the past that we give it credit. And there it is. There is actually um, this sort of site, and you, you can get an idea. It it's 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 sort of how can we got Mount Hebron over there? Okay, that that's mentioned in the Bible, and you've got the possible possible route, possible route of the Jews. Okay, we'll move that one out. Um, <coughs> But the possible routes of exchange, I think this is what we're talking about. You, you've got, you would cross the river, um, you'd cross the river Jordan, right? This is obviously taken from a Bible text. You've got a possible route of the Jews. So, uh, and the reason why I'm dismissing that is that I'm using a possible route of, of trade. This is what we're talking about. Uh, the Jewish community would take many thousands of years be to become the Jewish community. Ob obviously, the walls of Jericho is a story told in the Bible based on an event maybe occurring about 4,000 years ago, not 11,000 years ago. There's a difference here, right? Um, and what we've got within this landscape is the tectonic plates within this sort of wonderful Jordan Valley, this Jordan River that goes from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea. Now, um, so this sets it in in the middle of a sort of trade type like landscape. When when Kathleen Kenyon was excavating there, she worked out in some more of the upper layers that there, that there was evidence of trade between places as far away as Cyprus. Remember, then Cyprus is going to be quite some distance away because we don't have planes and cars and all the rest of it. And you've obviously got to go across the, this mountainous range to actually get to the Mediterranean and all the trade links to actually get get the trade in there in the first place. Um, and what we're talking about is is various different walls. As it, it, it sort of as things develop with this mound, you you've naturally got walls within walls, um, um, and it, it's that history of the walls collapsing and changing, and all the sort of interchange between the history and all that sense of understanding. So um, so what what we then what we then got with the archaeology is that we we've moved on from. Uh, we move on to something different now. Now this this is a rather interesting nuance. Sometime around 
sometime around 9,000 years ago. So we've got 11,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago. Um, we've got we've got changes in who these people are. So in other words, there's an outside influence. Um, that an outside influence uh, that is slightly different from before. So Kathleen Kenyon is seeing a change. Are these is this a wave of new people coming into the area? Is it is it a wave of people with a great deal of influence? Probably a great deal of influence. Uh, and this occupation indicates probably um, the arrival of newcomers with great influence from the north. Um, and probably what they're bringing into the area is is bees as well. There's this sense that they they've uh, I mentioned this the other week, didn't I? Um, when 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 you look at the Middle East, you've got um, you've got people um, a, a mix in um, northern bees with with southern bees that makes them more uh, more calmer and less vicious and. People have more beehives um, and you've obviously got access to the wax there and you've got access to the honey um, and you've got this landscape. And these people from Syria, they're probably bringing in these sort of new breed of honeybees as well. I know it sounds really be bizarre, but honeybees are massively important without the honeybee. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't get pollination. You wouldn't you wouldn't get honey. How, how could we not have honey on our toast? Right. But the, the main thing is you've got these new people coming in um, and then somewhere around 8,000 years ago, um, after wall building and various different changes, right, 8,000 years ago, uh, between 8,000 and 7,000 years ago, um, what's happening is that people do live at Jericho, but it's not as the great Jericho as it used to be. Things, things sort of decline a little bit, but people are still living there. So it still makes it the most continuous occupied site up to that point and it remains to be continuous about well, seven thousand years ago you've got more developments and there's more people at the site and you've got a new innovation you've actually got the new innovation of pottery right so this is the very important stuff that kathleen kenyon is using to read the layers again in the upper layers 7,000 years ago, you got the advent of fired pottery. There would have been indications of earlier types of clay vessels up until that point. But now you've got the advent and the introduction 7,000 years ago of a marked change in culture. You've got pottery. 7,000 years ago, you've got ceramic pottery. You've got pottery. Now, Seven seven thousand years ago, when when do we start using pottery in Britain? When when are the first bits of pottery being seen in Britain? So about um, five and a half six thousand years ago. So they're still a thousand years ahead of people in Britain, even in regards to pottery. But now things are starting to level. You know, we're down there. Things are starting to sort of level and get to sort of. Uh, this is what happens. Humanity does level out eventually. People get to the same level. If this if this civilization doesn't, if this civilization is happy with what it's doing, we will actually meet that level of where it is. Okay, so everybody's on parity. You know, it's it's a bit like um, this is a really bad metaphor. It's a bit like the Second World War. You know, the, the Russians, the, the the Germans, and the Americans before the Second World War were trying to develop the 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 atom bomb. Right. They were trying to develop nuclear fusion and all the rest of it, um, nuclear fission. Um, and they they and, you know, the Russians didn't know that the Germans were doing it. The Germans didn't know the Ameri the Americans were doing it. Right. Uh, but strangely enough, everybody would have got to that level of, anyway. Probably at the same time, everyone would have in invented the atom bomb. That's what we're talking about. But they all started at different stages. This always happens with humanity. This this always really this is the way it works. Um, even in complete isolation, our minds work and we get there, you know, you know every, everyone, everyone's going to have their own Charles Darwin eventually, but, but at different times in history. Mm. So, so the, so Jericho, the, now the interesting thing is, we, 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 did, did the skills to, did the skills for these people to have lots of the, the, the ceramic period, did, <coughs> did, um, did it develop in Jericho or was it brought in from elsewhere? But the, these, these, the, the, that's the big question, which we're not going to answer today. But the first pottery users of Jericho were, however, primitive compared um, with the predecessors on the site. Um, 
And what we mean by that, this is interesting. This is rather interesting. Um, remember, um, 10,000 years ago, we had sort of, we, we had walls and we, we had houses, we had um, rectilinear type houses. Um, and then 7,000 years ago, we've got pottery, but people have decided to live in cruder houses. They're living in sort of round houses, which is very, very odd. It's very, very odd that they, they, their civilization has almost gone back, but it's gone forward at the same time. It's like we're using pottery, but we're, we're not living in square and rectangular buildings. We're living in circular buildings, which are sort of sunk into the ruins of earlier buildings, but we're using pottery. It's really strange that. So Catherine Kenyon would have would have been quite, you know, that, that would have been a really interesting thing to have seen. One uh, uh, very odd, very odd, very, very. But we do see that in other civilizations. We we well, we we see that in in British history as well. That we that one minute we've got prehistory, um, and then you've got the Roman archaeology, and and then then almost as if you um, you've got this period of the early medieval period, don't you? That we that we that we've been doing in our other classes, which we'll be doing next week. Uh, and, and in a way, we, we sort of go back a little. We start to, to not build uh, rectilinear buildings that the Romans were building, right? We build circular buildings, sunken buildings like Grubenhausen's, right? We've got trade and we've got all the rest of it. Things go back a little bit. And then you've got the Norman period. We start building castles and so on. And a and, 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 and native uh, company, you start building sort of palaces and so on. So, uh, I, you know, it, it's quite strange. We do see this in archaeology. We don't always keep going. In, in, in civilization, we don't always keep going up the step ladder. It's like it's like it's like people. Uh, it's like somebody getting married and then suddenly you get divorced and you lose that lose everything. Have you had that experience, Goff? Because I have. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you've got everything, don't you? You've got the house, you've got the you've got the car, you've got the boat, and then you have a divorce. And Mrs. gets everything. You've got to start again. No, but, she gets the house and you get the mortgage. Fifty-fifty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. We know what we're talking about. But there is one thing that you and I got Goff do have, right? Um, what we do have, we've got knowledge. Um, it's almost as if we're able to use what we've got and we're able to go on. We're not able to get the house again straight away, right? But we're able to go on, right? Um, and it was a it was a bit like Michelle. I, I one minute I had a house, the next minute. Um, I got divorced. I was renting, and 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 then I meet meet Michelle. We got a house again. Brilliant, excellent. That's the way it goes. But um, but the, the the fact the fact of the matter is, it's um, this is what we see in civilization. It's not always a constant development. Right? It's not always that way. But so what we so back to what I said. You've got one minute you've got square buildings, and the next minute you've got circular buildings. But the one thing that the new new bit has seven thousand years ago is the pottery. They were probably make. They were probably um, instead of. Uh, this is another strange thing. These people that were using pottery, right, weren't the agriculturists that were before. They were pasturists. They were. They were development. They. They were um, reliant upon cattle. So it's almost as if it, like like a, an an, a, a, um, an Arabic mindset that you would uh, that you would have grazing animals rather than set arable agriculture that type of thing. Over the next two thousand years, so going going now, we're we're, we're starting to, to meet where we are up to about five thousand years ago. Um, th that's the way things are going. Things things don't massively develop, you know. Um, then, bingo, 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 bingo. So you would go five thousand years ago. They're starting to build the walls again, right? They're building the walls again. This 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 is really really odd. They 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 uh, one minute they're building walls, the next minute they're they're not bothering with their walls, you know. And and instead of um, plowing the fields, they've got cattle, and then that's all that. And then five thousand years ago, they're building the walls again, and the walls are built. Captain Kenyon believes rebuilt over um, you know. A thousand, two thousand years, over fifteen times, right? <coughs> so, um, and you know, you've got things that are going back and forth um, between between the the city being used as a town, a city, and um, and trading, and things go up and down like all sort of places in civilization, right? And, and the way you can describe this is a bit like um, Roman London. Um, it's sort of 
it becomes a backwater in the Anglo-Saxon period. And then in the Norman period, it becomes really important, that type of thing. Yeah. And around 4,000 years ago, we got those people from the Bible, the Canaanites. Here we go. The Canaanites, 4,000 years ago, the people of the Bible, the Canaanites reintroduced the great town life and excavations have provided evidence both of their houses and of their domestic furniture, which was found in their tombs as equipment of the dead in the afterlife. These discoveries have indicated the nature of the culture that the Israelites found when they were when they infiltrated into Canaan and that they largely adopted. So hang on a minute. Hang on, where are we? The Israelites. So you've got the Canaanites there. The Israelites must have captured um, the Canaanite city of Jericho. Bible, there we go. It's all coming together now. We all know about this. It's all coming together. Um, and therefore, the Canaanites influenced the Israelites. Um, and you've got the walls crumbling um, and Joshua and all these other things. And everything starts to come together, right? Everything starts to come together. Um, Jericho is famous in biblical history as a town attacked by the Israelites under Joshua after they crossed the Jordan River. So there we go. The Bible comes into it. Suddenly, it's in the Bible. Now, you know, I, I keep repeating. I, 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 lay out my, I lay out my stall in front of you. Every time I say that I, um, if I make mistakes in my lectures, I tell you if, if I've got certain beliefs, I tell you. I do believe that Jesus Christ existed, right? But I don't necessarily believe um, the New Testament, and I don't believe the Old Testament. I'm not a Christian, right? So I've got an open mind on this. Catherine Kenyon would have had an open mind as well. She would have been a Christian, but not necessarily believing what everything that the Bible said. But suddenly what she's got is evidence, evidence of the city that seems to have been destroyed and leveled and then rebuilt again using Canaanite building builders and so on, but now within the Israelite world, the Bible. After its destruction by the Israelites, it was, according to the biblical account, abandoned um, for some years, reused, established, and, and you've got another guy by the name of Beth, Bethelite established himself there around 3,000 years ago. Now, the archaeology is probably telling us something different, that the Israelites captured the city and they rebuilt it and all the rest of it. So it's slightly not completely in with what the Bible said. But there was a time that the city was leveled and the walls, the, the walls came down. The walls came down. I think that's the exact quote. Uh, it, it was captured by Joshua. So, so we're looking at some really good in, in information there jericho mentioned were mentioned several other times in the bible can i just stop a minute right just just stop now this is this is really really important because you might dismiss the bible and i've dismissed it and i've not dismissed it at the same time but lots of what we do see in the um old testament actually did happen Right. And, and we should believe it. If you're not a Christian, you don't believe. But but if you take it as an academic point, you can believe it. Right. But if we dismiss the Bible then we should dismiss every historical piece of work ever produced in history, uh, we should dismiss the Magna Carta as being fictitious. We should dismiss uh, the Bayer tapestry as being fictitious. We should dismiss the Landaf. Um, Chronicles, the Mabinogion, we should dismiss all these things because they were written in the past. So in saying that, I don't dismiss all those things. They're, they're historical references. They, they can be challenged. But there's some, worth, there's some worth in all these historical documents. And then we just look at the archaeology to see if those historical documents are fact or fiction. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying of some of the stuff in the Bible is proven at Jericho, but not all of it. I think that's a wise thing for me to say. And then eventually what we do see is Jericho into history again. Herod the Great established a winter residence at Jericho. 
and he died there in 4 BC. Now we know that Herod existed. It's not just in the Bible. Roman sources tell us about Herod. Herod had coins. Herod seen in Jerusalem. Herod is seen at Jericho. Facts. In the Bible, but they're facts. The Bible is like any historical document. It's been embellished and added to, to make it interesting. Oh, sometimes it's not interesting, is it? Oh, my God. Did you ever go to Sunday school? Oh. It's all that begetting. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Excavations, excavations conducted in 1950, 1951. And obviously, before you get to these walls, um, before you get to these walls and before you actually see these walls meters down, um, what Kathleen Kenyon excavated in the early excavations, didn't take over the excavations until the following year, I think, in 1952, but she was excavating there, um, revealed something of the Herodian Jericho, a magnificent facade um, that is believed was Herod's palace actually in Jericho. And it style illustrates Herod's devotion to Rome. So in other words, suddenly what we do see is evidence of a Roman style building at Jericho that would have influenced um, the palace. You know, the, the, the palace builders are influenced by Rome. So that's undoubtedly the, the, the palace that Herod would have stayed at and he must have stayed in a palace in 4 BC because that's where he died. We're not coming up. We're not coming up with two and two coming up with five. We're kind of with two and two coming up with probably four. That's what we're talking about. The likely answer is four. There's no other answer. It's got to be four. Um, and this is the other thing about Kathleen Kenyon. She wasn't just interested about getting down to um, the early stuff. She was finding traces of other buildings, you know, fine buildings that can be seen in this area. Um, and Jericho itself um, moves into the Roman period when Rome, Rome now is the ones in charge of the Holy Land. Um, and then Jericho moves into the New Testament. Um, and Jericho then sees itself in the in that time of the Crusaders. OK, we've got evidence in that sort of area and around the location of of crusader activity in the late 10 hundreds, in the 11 hundreds um, and and near and sort of there and thereabouts is the modern town that developed. So, you know, people people have been I don't know if I said this at the beginning, people have been living at Jericho for the best part of 11,000 years. Um, and if we put that into context, if we're looking at London, um, some archaeologists just dismissed that there was anything at London before the Romans got there. So London's been a city for just 2000 years. Right. A town, a settlement for 2000 years. Some of us archaeologists like myself believe that there were there was something in London before the Romans got there. That's why they got there. So a small settlement. But alongside the River Thames, there'd been probably something there just before the Romans there, right? But even, even then, it's still around 2,000 years. So there, there have been people living at Jericho for 11,000 years to, to London's too. And it then goes to show the importance of Jericho and why and what the why and the wherefores of Jericho and why we're doing that today. So uh, amazingly enough, um, without completely wearing myself out, I've been going on, I've done an hour and 10 minutes, which is, which is quite a record for me, nonstop without any interferences from Goff. No cackle. Right? No all, the, all the cackles or, you know, gobble, no gobble, gobble. Cackle free. Cackle free. Look, I, the, don't put this on record that Jim's a right nana, right? Because I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! You know these um, these uh, yeah. these twentieth century archaeologists that we talk about, like Kath, Catherine uh, Kenyon. Kenyon, were they sponsored by universities or museums, or did they have loads of money to be able to go there and do all this stuff? Um, 
I, pro I probably, I, I can't be diplomatic on this one. Gertrude Cato Thompson had money to excavate the Great Zimbabwe, right? So, you know, lots of these people come from rich families. Um, uh -huh. Catherine Kenyon would have been sponsored by a father British Museum to go to Oxford and all the rest of it. But but then again, then I got, again, aren't most people, male and female, who go to university at that time sponsored by rich families? I wouldn't have been able to go to a university back then, no matter how good I was. Um, um, because I didn't have a rich family. Well, so, I was saying, if you want to go to West Wales and do some excavation, you've got to scramble around, try and raise money, haven't you, for archaeology Cymru? Yes. It's a big struggle. You're doing things that are, you know, well, yes, on, yes. But these are big things that they're doing there, then, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, the, these, so these, these... have loads of dosh, I suppose. Well, I, actually, to be honest with you, when you put in the Bible, there's there's lots of people who want to know about the Bible. If I if I if I was Goff, if if I wanted to retire next week, um, all I would need to do is write a load of books about biblical archaeology and really know my stuff. I could go, do a tour of lectures. I would have loads of people going along, and there would be loads of people wanting to give me money to excavate in the Holy Land. That's the difference, right? Um, digging, as you put it, holes in West Wales is is not is not as fashionable as the Bible, right? So it's where fashionable archaeology is. If if I wanted to um, if I wanted to organise a trip to the pyramids next week, right? I could probably get ten people just like that, and I could probably charge a packet, and you know, we we, we I could make a, a nice sum of money out of it. I could do that every year, and I wouldn't need to do these lectures, right? It's it's what well I, I like doing these lectures, but the fact of the matter is, um, it's it's it, it, it's it's Oh, OK, I think the answer to the question is, is the archaeologists excavating? This is this is the big thing, right? Sir Mortimer Wheeler had to raise the money from public subscription to excavate at Killian. He didn't get the money overnight. He, he, even though he was quite an eminent archaeologist, he had to get people to fund his excavation at um, Maiden Castle. Right. He had to. He had to go with people, and, and he, he had to. Um, one, one, one second, one second, Jess. I'm, I'm just uh, doing my question, so stay on the phone. Stay there. So, so basically, Sir Mortimer Wheeler had to work hard, Goff, right? Kathleen Kenyon didn't, because there was already money there to do her work. That's the difference. Okay. So. So Mortimer Wheeler was was from a different school than Catherine Kenyon, but they they believed in the same thing. Catherine Kenyon had a pot of money to do her work because what she was doing was <clears throat> fashionable. Basil Brown, on the other hand, when he excavated the program based on the dig um, at Sutton Hoo, didn't have any money. He had to go cap in hand like Sir Mortimer Wheeler. Right. So even though you've got people um, who who who. Basically, all of these people could be said to be of privilege, right? Basil Brown, not, but Sir Mortimer Wheeler, yes, and Kathleen Kenyon. But Kathleen Kenyon's doing fashionable archaeology, Sir Mortimer Wheeler isn't. So hopefully that answers your question. I, I, I'm the Sir Mortimer Wheeler because I've got to raise money. Kathleen Kenyon doesn't. That's the difference. That's okay, that's fine. Thanks. Right, so that's your question. And Keith, what's your question? Uh, was the Jericho the first city we know that had walls? Or was it couldn't other large cities nearby were content? Well, when, when we look at Jericho, I mm. haven't mentioned um, Chattel Hayek. Chattel Hayek, even though it's developing about a thousand years later in Turkey, that didn't have a wall around it. Um, um, Godepi Tepe, that doesn't have a wall around it either. So the point is, the, the big the big point is, uh, the answer to your question, this is the first city, that the town that we know of with a wall around it. Right. Not necessarily the earliest. Th there are earlier settlements developing, but yeah. this—that's the answer to the question. Yes, yeah, it's the first yeah. one. And if they didn't have pottery for a thousand years, having a city, how did they carry their water around? Um, um, you, you've got wooden containers. You've got um, uh, um, stone containers. You would you would have also had. Um, uh, we, we think, for example, the development of, of butter churning was actually by using a gut of an animal carrying milk. It was left out and butter was, you know, we, yeah. there's other things. And the other thing as well is, Keith, there's there's the development of the idea that they may have used pottery 
that wasn't very much fired and they stored goods in it. And then when water got to it, if you've ever, when I was a child, I used to make marbles out of clay in the garden. I used to put them in the oven. Then yeah. I used to put them outside and then and, and the water used to get to them. They used to go back to clay. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Just because there's an absence of evidence doesn't mean to say they didn't have early clay pottery, but that would have been more about eight or 9,000 years ago rather than 11,000 years ago. So in other words, there were other things what we look at Scara Bray, for example, in Orkney, they, they didn't really use pottery at an early stage. They used stone containers to store things rather than pottery. Right. All right. OK. So what we're going to do, folks, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to talk to our Jessica. Who I right, met with Stephanie. OK. okay. Then. I'll have a chat. You two have a chat. Um, I'm going to make a coffee.
You there, Keith? Hello. Yep, I'm here. I meant to tell you, there's a good um, podcast on the sounds, BBC Sounds. Right. It's called um, uh, History of the World in 100 Objects. Oh, I think I've heard of that. It's, yeah. well, it's on the radio as well for 15 minutes before the news. Right, right. Oh, before the arches. Oh, uh, Professor Neil McGregor from the British Museum. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, yes. Really I, good. I think I heard of that. I, I think it's uh, been on before. But I mean, yeah, I yeah, it was done before. 10 years yeah. ago, actually. Oh, was it? Right. Yes, yeah, so oh, I yeah, it's very good. The, uh, la- oh, yesterday was the um, the astrolobe, right? You know the brass astrolobe, yes, that, for navigation uh, and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah very mm. good. I thought I thought you might like that. Yes, Probably yes. Have heard of it. Yes, I will. Ice free. Mm. Unlike That's Carl's better. effort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, even better. You sound like you've got a bad uh, cold there, mate. Yeah, it is. It is. It always always goes to my chest because I've got asthma. So, uh, oh, right. It always ends up there. Never yeah. mind. It only lasts a couple of days normally. Yeah, inshallah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Where is he then? Oh, who knows? Know. Feeding his goat. Probably. Feeding himself and his goat. He was eating toast earlier. Didn't offer any to us. Is there um, tea making facilities in the church? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, only Karen can use it because she's authorised, but nobody else is. So she goes out and brings in a big sort of uh, kettle, effectively, you know, with all the hot water in. And, and then it out. And you take your own mug, a bit like back in the old days. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yes, that's it. So uh, we'll sit around a couple of big tables just at the top. Um, yeah, so it's a very big hall. Plenty of air. We open all the windows. Oh, yeah. yeah good. Yeah, so, well, I might pop up sometime. Yeah, so far, so good. Yeah. I'd really like to do sort of like three weeks with Jess and then one week with Carl, you know, just to keep in touch with Carl as well as Jess. Exactly. Oh, by the way, um, bottle top. So yep. you want to dump some... Um, when are you thinking of next going up to the village? Uh, probably not for a few days until I get rid of this cold at the moment. But uh, um, uh, let me give you my phone number. And you can text. Have you got them up? No, I don't know. I can give you a phone call. Okay. Well, uh, in the old me, days. Okay. It's um, you got a pen there? He's not recording, is he? Oh, I don't care. Oh, all right. Okay, then go ahead, Gaff. Zero seven eight. Zero seven eight. One three one. One three one. Nine nine eight two four. Nine nine eight two four. And that is. So if if you go in, it's gonna go up, and I'll yeah. try and. Okay. Share. We'll have an assignation in the car park. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good to me. I've oh, got. Oh, yeah, doing your shopping, you know. And yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Well, I, I'm going to meet Goff outside the public toilets. I thought it was behind the public toilets, isn't it? They're closed. Well, no co- what, the, what, I shut up. The public toilets in Lantra are closed. Yeah, no cottage in, no. Oh. You're out of luck, Carl. He's got no income now, then, has he? Well, no, it was me and Jim. We were into that big time. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you actually <laughs> say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, um, Kathy ran the show when it was me and Jim in the cottage in. Well, that's... The cottage. Oh, right. Apparently, apparently, it was new cottage industry. <laughs> oh dear. Oh god. Anyway, happy yeah. days. Let, let's yeah. crack. Let, what? Like, I was listening to all that then about bloody free classes. That's terrible. What? What's wrong with that? That's old pensioners. We're poor. Yeah, but who actually pays for these people to do the work in the first place? What work? They don't do these bloody podcasts for free. Well, the BBC pay them, don't they? In the, the British Museum. Yeah. Have you heard of it? It's really good. All oh, right. So, so what? Do, what type of thing do they do? Well, last or yesterday it was um, the astrolabe, and it was oh, uh, right. it was one that was made in Spain. 
Ah, that that the the, the famous one, yeah. Made on it was really really interesting. It's only on for fifteen minutes, so it's you know, and it's put over very well. The music's good. Yeah. Yes. Neil McGregor, Professor Neil McGregor. I've heard of Neil McGregor before. He's heard of you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're famous. Yeah, I, I, I know. I'm. I, well, you know. But by the way, right? Why haven't you bought a copy of my new book, Goff? See, I knew I'd get it in there eventually, Keith. Right, anyway, crack on. Oh, oh yes! Can't oh. Hey, hey, talk, talk. Hey, do you know what? I've, I've led myself into something that I, I haven't I haven't mentioned. Um, next week, we're going to be doing Cranogs and Goff. For yeah. the first time in two months that your 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 class fees and Keith class fees are now ready, due. Okay. Not a problem. I paid you already. I paid you yesterday. Uh, Keith, I gotta double check this, Keith, because you know you could, you could do a swift one like Jim. Yeah, no. Is it forty six pounds, is it? Fifty it's only, a nunk. It's forty for us, isn't it? No. Sure it is. <laughs> It's, it's, it's 60 for people who actually got full-time jobs and work, and it's £50 for people who are required. Required. Yeah, I'm always required. Oh, I saw your girlfriend this morning. She Which sent one? her best wishes and said she hasn't seen you for ages, and where are you? That's Stephanie. No, it's Liz. Oh! Did, 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 she, did she ask if I was going to bring her back some fudge from Orkney again? Yeah, well, no, she didn't mention fudge. She just said, where is he? I, I said, I mentioned I was up there doing my car and I said, I, I've got my uh, Zoom with professor, the professor, as, as she calls you. And uh, he said, oh, where, where has he been? Where has he been? Where has he been? Where has he been? Where has he Oh, bless her. Yeah. You were missed. Yeah, I, I I know I'm missed. I I know I know I'm always missed. I'm I'm a bit of a remiss missed. I'm missed. Oh God! I didn't tell her you weren't well. You and you, you know, there was the long COVID. Yeah. I, I don't, thanks for that. I don't think there's any bloody cure for it this minute for anything really. Well, I thought you didn't believe in it anyway. So, what the hell? Right. Let, let me just let me just say one thing, right? I was the first one who was bringing bloody hand cream and face masks and gloves into the class in February, right? Everyone laughed at me. And when I was handing out the... Now you've really got me now. When I was handing out the face masks and stuff, everybody said, oh, we're not going to wear these. And when I was giving out, oh, we're not going to use any of this. And then a few months, months later, it was, it was um, mandatory to wear face masks and to use hand cream and to wear gloves in some places. And who are the mugs? Get on with it. Get on with it. You got me on a soapbox then. <laughs> Let's get some information. Come on. Tell All us. right. Okay, okay, okay. You, you, you two are like a bunch of bloody old women. Do you yeah. know what I would prefer to do, Jim? We've heard that about you. <laughs> me, me, and, me, me, and, me and good old Jim. Me, me, and, me and Jim us. Right, so... Um, Right. Okay. Okay. Let, let's let's crack on, folks. We were. Um, I I was looking at um, Jericho, and I need to get into the flow of things again. Um, and we meant. I think the last thing we mentioned was about the Crusaders, wasn't it? So, all oh, right. Looking at the layers. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So, Goff, are you still there, Goff? Yeah. I'm here. So you should be goff. Right. Now, you're, you're looking at the mound itself side on and obviously layer after layer. So the Old Testament Jericho um, itself, 21 meter, you know, from, from, from ground level, 21 meters of archaeology. Um, and it projects itself from the surrounding plane. And all the layers that you're looking at there, all the layers that you're looking at there, and if we if we move the image again, hang on, we, we, oh, see, I'm changed all the all the layers we're looking at. Um, take take the site site back eleven thousand years, which is which was quite amazing. Uh, and these are some of the more uh, later buildings 
probably from about um, probably from around 2000 years ago. So the site itself, the, the one thing about the site is that we don't get um, the site with the same date range across the whole thing. Uh, um, there's there's bits of evidence that have been uh, the, there's bits of the site that are from um, mainly from one date, but you've obviously got all the different layers as well, and other bits of the site from um, other kinds of dates. So obviously, we're, we're talking about this huge, wonderful mound of layers of the archaeology. So the the obviously the one thing was to of Kathleen Kenyon in archaeology. One of the things that we do is we put together a brief. Uh, it's called a project design, and Kathleen Kenyon's project design, as then in by 1952, she was director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. Her brief, she would have put together a brief, and the brief would have been, "Is what is this mound at Jericho?" Um, and somebody said, "Well, yeah," and he said, "Does does the mound have evidence?" Um, of Roman activity? Does the mound have evidence of archaeology that, that dates back 4,000 years? Does it have evidence of this and does it have evidence of that? And she would have put in there, one of the main objectives has been to establish, um, what, she would have put in there, one of the main object objectives would be, um, can we establish the date of the town's destruction by the Israelites? Um, and how are we going to do this? So this would this would be put in a project to design. How how are we going to excavate the site? Are we going to excavate all of the site? Are we going to excavate part of the site? Um, so this was all seen to be a matter of importance for the chronology of the Israelite entry into um, Cana, um, the landscape of the Canaanites. So so obviously what we're talking about is these people, the Canaanites, being at uh, Jericho. The Israelis come in, um, the Israelites come in, um, led by Joshua. Can we prove or disprove that? Is is the site the the one thing the one thing would have been was not to necessarily prove that the Israelites or the Canaanites existed. It would have been to see if there's any activity at the time that these events in the Bible occurred, and both of those objectives were achieved. Most of the town of the period, including the whole circuit of the town walls, um, has either been destroyed by erosion or some of the stones removed. But enough of it did survive to show um, evidence of the period that we're talking about around 4,000 years ago. And then what we then find is other evidence that the site um, is affected by some other events around 3,300 years ago. So sometime we see the site with various different changes. Um, and eventually the site of Jericho coming into the, the Roman period and all the rest of it um, sees periods of abandonment. But then we actually do find is that there's evidence nearby of Christian worship and there's evidence nearby of mosques and palaces and nearby as well, associated with the with the overall history of Jericho, among the best preserved are the remains are exquisite mosaic panels and panels for which the complex is renowned. So we've got later archaeology there as well, um, and um, archaeology associated with the Islamic period into the 700s. So it would have been a minor Ottoman um, place in the in the times of the Ottoman Empire, and obviously the British Mandate. Uh, and the, the city continued into the 1940s with the changes with the Islamic State. And obviously, with everything that we do know, the site has seen a continuous occupation for 11,000 years. So what I wanted to do is have a little bit more look at the images um, and see all the large mounds. And basically, you can see in the archaeology at some stage in more uh, later periods, you can see this thick stone layer across there spread across this part of the site and various layers of um, buildup another bit of a stone layer more layers of buildup another uh, build up a stone layer various different earth changes and earth color which would have been very important to Kathy and Kenyon and their excavations and obviously this later stage of building but this is that tower which has been behind me um, for most of this uh, presentation 
and you can actually see there's a little trap door in there as well so um this this would have actually held storage um and you can actually see around where they've had to excavate down and you've got little steps down there and you can actually still see this today but several meters um, of the base of this tower have been built up with various erosion and silt and the biggest problem is with this type of archaeology and allowing it to be um, shown like this is eventually uh, the site will start to decay and the earth will start to backfill so it could have, it could be in the future years that they might actually put some kind of cover over this so that uh, people can see it for later generations and you can imagine that that tower is one of a number of uh, impressive towers that would have been the walls of this wonderful city of Jericho throughout the history of Jericho going back 11,000 years. And th there you go. Um, and what you can see as well is that you can see this great tower and another uh, wall um, of a different period along the side, alongside these these concrete steps that go all the way down, uh, which are obviously more modern. And again... The, the one thing with Kathleen Kenyon's excavations is that um, they were quite limited over the site. They were in specific areas, as we mentioned, the large trenches, as uh, she's excavating down to actually read the layers. And this was a very, very interesting um, uh, plan. Um, I'm just going to double check on something a minute. Uh, there we go. We're going to go to that eventually. So this sort of thing in the Bible... Um, the, the, the bugle is blowing, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the walls of Jericho collapse. A Joshua and his Israelites capture the Canaanite city. And if we if we look at this, this wonderful little sort of ancient Jericho, towns became bigger as their populations increased, obviously. This made their architecture and urban planning more complex and they required more space to expand. And you can actually clearly see that. So you've got the internal city and then they thought, oh, right, we've got more people. So we've got to we've got to expand the city. This is what that's sort of saying. Um, the possibility of storing food surpluses meant that part of the population um, quit agricultural activities to devote their time to other things. So obviously you've got uh, priests, traders, artisans, leaders all being supported by this surplus, which builds this sense of a town and a community. So the wealth of flourishing cities attracted greed of the nomadic tribes and forced their inhabitants to build protective walls around the cities. Is that the real reason why they need to build these walls? Because these walls are massively impressive. Um, is it to protect? Well, well, you know, there's different questions as we, we led ages ago in this. This was the case of Jericho in the West Bank, Palestine, with a history of more than 11,000 years. This was the first fortified known city um, up to that point, it is considered the first city in history, mm. uh, definitely with a wall around it. So what we've got, we've got these Natufian hunter groups who settled at the spot. Now, it's saying 14,000 years ago. It's, it's 3,000 earlier than the date <laughs> I actually gave. Um, and this is more like it towards around 11,400 years ago. The settlement had 70 houses with around 1,000 inhabitants. And something unprecedented with a 3.5 meter high wall, which was two meters um, thick and a stone tower that reached a height of 8.5 meters. So this this I, I'm always believing that this is the tower that they're describing behind us because it's quite low in the archaeology. So um, and then, as I mentioned, um, the, the, what I mentioned earlier on, as I was discussing, what happened is that the buildings changed from. Uh, these 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 square rectilinear buildings um, and it's saying about 9,000 years ago I think I gave a different date to that to circular buildings and this is when um, then I think we were talking about that 7,000 years ago we were talking about the sense of pottery um, and then they're moving from these circular buildings um, were, were um, so the roundhouse is made with adobe similar to the igloos were then substituted with rectangular ones. So this constant changing and the way these buildings are built from, from clay, stone, clay, uh, buildings uh, with these, these rectilinear buildings with courtyards, um, and it goes the glory and collapse. The apparition, um, the apparition of the Canaanites implied changes in house planning. 
the people absorbed original culture and took Jericho to its most glorious times. According to archaeological records, the city was destroyed. Again, another date when the city could have been destroyed. So the dates move back and forth. Um, it talks about double fortification. So you've got this internal wall, external wall, gateways, uh, similar to medieval fortifications. These were three meters wide and more than four meters high by um, by by the year um, 1,700 years BC. They were reconstructed at least 15 times. So you've got walls and towers reconstructed 15 times. Um, there is evidence of cultivated plants and possible sheep breeding. Um, so, you know, you've got different changes. You've got the sense of the canals, as we mentioned, the Jordan River. Um, Jericho was favoured by the river and trade. Its walls became thicker and were surrounded by a moat. Um, and you've got um, two-story buildings, which is another innovation. Two-story buildings coming in. Um, and again, th this is again having buildings that, that go more than uh, one level. So that's another massive innovation. So, you know, all again, again, give you an idea of what the tower looked like. And obviously, over time, you've got buildings built upon buildings and changes, circular buildings, rectangular buildings, stone buildings, mud built buildings, towers, walls, and all the rest of it, all these changes, all these different sequences, um, agricultural, um, arable landscape, pastoralism, and so on. So um, next, what I would like to do is I'd like to look at two different areas. We're going to look at... Um, we're going to look at this skull um, and then we're going to look at what this image means. So let's just let's just go back. Um, so here we go. Let's get to my notes. This is actually a skull covered in plaster with sort of um, shells to indicate the eyes. And this is this, this is rather um, an important piece of archaeology. Um, so I'm just going to go to my notes. Uh, right. This this is actually known as the Jericho skull. Yeah. Um, they found a number of skulls like this, but this this is the famous one that they've analysed, the Jericho skull, and this dates back to around ten thousand years ago. So the Jericho Jericho skull, which is a, among a number of skulls found like this, was found in 1953 by archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon. Um, and there's actually podcast about this if you look at it on the internet, Jericho skull. Um, Kenyon thought that the skulls uh, were portraits of some of the earliest people to live in Jericho and was thrilled with this new discovery. The skulls she found had been decorated with plaster to recreate human faces and had shells and as eyes. Some showed traces of paint. So obviously this is, a, this is a, the famous one um and at the time this person was alive around um the dates vary in this article around 9500 years ago jericho was one of the largest settlements in the middle east which we've accepted mourning the dead was one of the shared rituals that helped bind the society together initially each plastered skull would have been a known individual but as time passed they likely became ancestor figures who may have been worshipped. It's thought that they were safely buried as portraits of community <clears throat> forebears long after their individual identities were forgotten. Um, so obviously what we're talking about, a skull like this, they would have thought, oh, you know, that that's so-and-so. And then after a few hundred years, they would have thought, we don't know who this person is, they're, they're like a godhead figure. So they'd have put them safe. So there are a number of these, and this is the famous one. Um, and what they did... If we if we move the slide on again, what we what they did a side on view. There you go, and you can see that the skull is slightly unusual. It's been elongated, right? Because you've got the growth patterns there, show that the the skull's a little bit bowed, and this is full with the X rays and the CT scan. The CT scan this was, um, X ray would have just picked up the bone, but this is a CT scan. Um, they, they worked out that the skulls were actually filled with earth and, and clay and uh, and that they, they that, that this is how they held together. And 
the the one thing finding out about the person underneath the plaster was challenging the soil packing the inside of the cranium meant little internal detail could be made out using conventional x-rays um so what they then tried to do is take this skull and make a bit of a reconstruction the ct scan fortunate um so what they've done since um over the past decade they used CT scanning, and this non-intrusive scan allowed the research team to see the interior of the skull and digitally remove the layers of plaster and soil. So it's sort of digitally removing rather than physical. So they're able to read the different layers. The detailed um, imaging revealed some surprising facts about this individual's life. The team found out that the skull belonged to a man who was over 40 years old. When he died, he had broken teeth that were badly decayed and abscesses that must have caused him pain. Um, so they found out that his nose had been broken in life as well. Uh, but this injury had healed before the man died. So they're doing a CT scanning. They're working all this out. Uh, and actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually move to the article that I've got in front of me, which makes this a little bit more sense. Um <laughs> And they're saying that the most striking feature is that the, the head had been bound, um, the head shape, varying thickness of the bone. If we go back to, you can see that the varying thickness is thicker at the back where it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that thick. Your, your, your bone structure on your skull, your cranium should actually be the same thickness all the way through. Um, uh, but this is clearly that, that showing that the, 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 the head's been bound. So rather interesting thing there. And, it, and it's been tightly bound as an infant, permanently changing its shape. Mm. Um, going Anyway, back to back to what we want. Go, going back to this again. There you go. Um, studies of the scan um, results um, that they were able to slowly start to reconstruct the skull. So what, what they did, they, um, they, they worked out that uh, the nose cavity <coughs> scanning, this is, this is a digital scanner. They actually made this. So, um, and what they did, they then added, um, I think they're um, digitally adding then the ear and the muscle, right? The ear and the muscle um, through these pegs, all, all of the layers of your skin, or your skull has different layers of skin on it, which you, which is averaged. So they're doing that and they're using the reconstruction um, and by 2016, when the data from the micro CT scan was used to make a 3D printed model of the man's skull, which is in fact that, uh, from this starting point, a lower jaw created by copy copying other examples of a similar size and date was added to the model. A painstaking process of reconstructing a person's face then began with specialists building up facial features, and that's what that is average muscle in people's faces, um, muscle layer after layer, a method originally created to make forensic reconstructions for the police. And that's that's what he looked like. <coughs> well, i got to be honest with you, Keith. He looks a bit like you. Yeah, he's very handsome, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> ugly. A, a completely ugly looking brute. I've got to be honest with you. Um, oh, Keith, you're, you're very attractive. Look at his skull. Look at his... It, it's almost as if the, the, the skull has been elongated in a way yeah um yeah. and so there's got the Very facial close. reconstruction there oh he doesn't he look cute yeah you could do with some hair yeah he could do <laughs> yeah. yeah uh the the face of a man that lived and died over nine thousand five hundred years ago um um to be seen for the first time since his plaster likeness was created in in ancient jericho how did they get that mole on the side of his face that's what i want to know <laughs> Um, th so basically, this is a long process to get a reconstruction of an ancient face. So, so there we go. Yes, yes, that's good. I, I do, I do think he do, does look a bit like you, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> they all do. He's human. No, I, actually, he looks a bit like Kathy, to be honest with you. But we, but, but she's not you. <laughs> she's not here to defend herself. And then finally, what I want to do is I want to finish on this next image there. The other amazing thing about Catherine Kenyon's excavations was the excavated Jericho bones. Right. Um, and we're, we're just going to have a quick look at this. Right. Um, 
Dating back thousands of years, tuberculosis was a killer in antiquity and is still one of the world's deadliest diseases, with one third of the world's population infected and approximately three million deaths per year. So obviously more people die per year than have died of COVID. Um, now the fight to find a cure for the disease could be uh, boosted by the study of 6,000-year-old human bones excavated by Kathleen Kenyon in Jericho in the 1950s. The bones are being analysed uh, by various teams, uh, one from Israel, one from Palestine, one from Germany. Uh, the study of ancient diseases using material taken from mummified bodies and human remains, like um, Jericho, is very important to understanding how diseases work, how they develop and how we find a cure for them. The aim is to understand the origins of tuberculosis and they actually leprosy as well. Um, and its evolution using Jericho evidence is important because it is one of the earliest nucleated settlements dating back, as we know, 11,000 years and hence likely to have been a place where communicable diseases might have developed. Leading the Israel team, um, a certain um, Spiegelman um, from the um, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, who said that the preliminary work on the bone suggests that there is sufficient DNA in the samples to make a contribution to our understanding of the origins and development of microbial disease, which could provide crucial information in the evolution of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. By examining human and animal bones from Jericho, uh, we will be able to see how the first people living in a crowded situation developed the diseases of crowds and how this affected the disease through the changes in DNA of both the microbes and the people. And then finally, the inclusion of animal remains in the study is based on theory that some communicable diseases, as I said earlier, um, uh, resulted from the close approximation of humans and animals, a consequence of the development of, of husbandry. Yes. Um, Spiegelman also believes that knowing how a disease developed in the past will help us understand what it will do as it continues to evolve and will ultimately impact on the way that public health officials set about combating the disease. Um, so what we're saying, uh, one, one thing about the bones at Jericho um, <clears throat> Kathleen Kenyon um, was naturally very interested in the bones, but back then we didn't have the dating um, and testing um, and all the techniques that we've actually got today to look at the bones. Um, and lots of these bones were actually kept in uh, a university in um, Sydney, I do believe. Um, and it's only it's only sort of since the 1970s that these bones have been examined. And the one key thing, which which I'll close with is that they've examined these bones from Kathleen Kenyon's collection. Um, one minute they don't have any signs of TB, um, leprosy or anything like that. And then at, and she basically said, well, these come from that layer, um, an earlier layer. And then the bones above it actually show signs of TB um, and leprosy and other things. Yeah. And, and, and one minute you're going from no, no evidence of leprosy and the next minute you've got... Um, um, loads of evidence of leprosy and, and tuberculosis. And, and they're saying that somehow they'll be able to work out why there was that leap. Because one moment people started getting TB and leprosy and it must have been absolutely horrific. Yes. You, know, you know, to just suddenly one yeah. minute everybody's OK and then more and more people are moving in and then suddenly people are dying. Um, and OK, sensibly, it's a bit like it's a bit like... Um, it's a bit like COVID. Suddenly, one minute, you know, the world's okay, and then the next minute, the world's topsy turvy because of um, COVID. But this has always happened in hum humanity. This is nothing new. Um, and you know, we, we've got to somehow uh, mitigate to stop these things happening. But I've got to say this: that we as humans don't seem to learn from anything because this has been going on. But these bones dating back to six, seven thousand years or beyond, right? We've not learnt in all these years how to combat these problems because we're still making the same old mistakes. Um, and it's why archaeology is so important to actually try and learn to prevent things before they <coughs> happen. And maybe we will. Maybe, maybe, maybe if there's another COVID around the corner, we can stop it, nip it in its bud by not, not having it happen in the first place, you yeah. know?
if we all become vegetarian, then there won't be these things from animal dung. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, exactly, Keith. Yeah, that, that, that was really there, you know. Yeah, I know this is a thing. Out. This is the thing. Apparently, in five or six years' time, they're trying to convince McDonald's to have burgers that are, uh, that are made of vegetarian meat. Yeah, it's grown in a lab. A, a meat grown in a lab. Yeah. I don't look forward to that. So, 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 in other words, what you could do, the, the, the Goff's gonna, Goff is going to ask this, right? When Goff eats a, um, a a beef burger from McDonald's, he knows that he's eating the the um, male members and and testicles and all yeah. these other things that they, they, they ears. Yeah, exactly. Stomach. Tongues. Yeah. Sphincters. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff, right? <laughs> so, in other words, right? Probably. In other words, Keith, right? Instead of um, eating the remains of a pig's penis, right? Yep. You can actually see a pig's penis being grown in a laboratory and then ground down to make that burger. And yep. I, I'm sure that would be more acceptable. That would be a lot better. I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, so you can actually see the pig's penis being grown and then eat it. I think that's that's quite... <laughs> that would be a delicacy in some parts of the world. Yeah, it would, definitely in Lanswick Major. Yep. You, could actually, you could actually have grown, grown pig's, pig's teats. Um, you could you could be going down the street saying fake wolf nipple chips grown in a laboratory down the road, getting them while they're hot. Exactly, albatross, albatross, albatross. No, no, fake albatross yes, grown in a laboratory, yeah. vegetarian. Get it now, yeah. albatross. Beetroot, beetroot, beetroot. Yeah, there's beetroot everything these days. You go into Marks and Spencer's, half of it is full of beetroot. Beetroot, beetroot. burger. That's be no, that's what it is. No, Keith, you've missed it, right? Right. Because because we can't get rid of these beetroots to Europe now. There's all these farmers with these beetroots everywhere. Yeah, of course. You've got to do something with them, so you might as well turn them into human food. Yeah, ex exact exactly. You know, one of um, the well, problem is with uh, Goff, right? He, he had this sexual fantasy that he went to meet somebody out outside the public toilets. It involved having a, having a bath um, naked with somebody uh, full of uh, beetroot. In beetroots, yeah, I've heard of that. Tin, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that I'm as not, well. Well known for it. Very known for it, yeah. <laughs> and Goff hasn't said a word. Right, Goff, any questions yeah. you want to ask before we... Shut up, Keith. No, any I, questions I'm only going to go there. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thanks for telling me about Catherine Kenyon and the walls of Jericho. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that, that was good. I enjoyed that one. I enjoyed that one. Thank you for that, Goff. And uh, Keith, anything you'd like to say, darling? No, I don't think so. Uh, I know. How do we know that's Jericho? Did they find a street sign saying this is Jericho? <laughs> Sorry. How do we know it was Jericho? Because they found a Bible in the wall. It said... Um, this be Jericho. Yeah, yeah. And do you know when my, you, you know when my dad went to the uh, Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? Yeah. He, he put wailed. a note in the wall. It said, Gary from Barry. <laughs> I think I think Keith's been hanging around Jim too long. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no, you don't. Oh, the thing is, J Jim's decided to hang around the public toilets in um, Cowbridge because they're open. <laughs> they're better quality he, there, you see. Have you noticed? Um, got um, he goes to Cowbridge a lot because he always says to um, he always says to Keith, "Can I bring this book back for you or something?" That's just the way it is. I don't think there's any answer there, is there? <laughs> you know that yeah. um, you know that bloke in Austria some years ago that kidnapped the girl for about twenty years. Fritzel, his name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he looks like Jim. See. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> oh dear. Does Jim know that? Well, no, he's not here, so I can say that. But I I've often thought that when I first met him. I said, God. That's Fritzel. Oh, we got it. No, you can. Nobody can go until we've we've seen this on the internet. What? So it's and he looks, um, like, and he looks like George Galloway. Hang on, Fritzel. What? What's the name of it? The Fritzel case. Yeah. In Austria. Oh, right. You use an image of it now. Hang on a minute. Right. Yeah. You. Here we go, folks. I'm going to show this on the screen. Okay. This. Okay. This. This, according to um, Goff, is what um, Jim. Jim looks like. Here Jim. we go. There. Yeah. Oh. 
Dead Bug Dead Bosch. Wow. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell's that there? This is. I don't know what you got into there. Probably serial killers of the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. They're, 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 they're apparently that's Jim. Okay. All right. Oh, well, he, it was full Fritz, so he didn't murder them. He just no, he just them. kept them up, didn't he? Yes, yes, that's true. He just yeah. cut them up? No, locked kept, them up. Locked them up. How many people did he lock up? 709. There, there's Jim. It was loads he, for years, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Oh, dear. How many people were we thinking? I don't know. I think it was just a couple of women, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was a girl. they were girls and they, grew, they had babies yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. Was, yes, it was a horrible case. Yeah. He had yeah. babies with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Didn't you know you heard about it? No, it's not the type of thing. I, I've got to be honest with you, Goff. It's not the type of thing I... um. Well, it was famous. I mean, have you got Netflix? Yeah, I'm really going to put it on after this. I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Well, it's on the, the, the documentaries on Netflix about it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I'm... It's called Lucky Jim. It's uh, it's great. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, it's not the only case, is it? There's many other cases like that as well. Yeah, they have. In Barry, there's a few... Oh, it's normal in Barry, isn't it? Incest. Oh, and that, ba and that family that got killed in it was it was about two, 1999. About uh, uh, there was that that father who had five children and his wife, and and he decided um, that he, he killed the whole family. That was seven people, yeah. and I yeah. was in Barry. Oh, mind you, I felt like killing my kids a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Never mind. Come on then. My oh God, I got I got this bloody Fritzel guy on my computer. I don't. I I feel. <laughs> the thing is, I I feel violated now. Do you imagine yeah. the police coming here and saying, "Oh, well, we'll get, you know, you've got something dodgy about yes. you." Yes, you're interested you're on the internet. In that, they probably yeah. you That's it. You're researching dodgy emails now from people. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have like a fan club development of all what, these sadomasochists. The, the Fritzel, the Fritzel Club. <laughs> oh dear. He was just lonely, that's all. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's good. He'd get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, enough of this. Do you know I've got, I've got I've got no names, but there was somebody else who used to come along to our classes who was who lived alone as well. But mind, mind you, so did Dennis. But but Dennis didn't go around keeping people in his bloody uh, basement. As far as we know. We don't know. We don't know. But what do you knows? mean? So what you're saying now is is in Dennis's... That's terrible. I love Dennis to bits. You can't... Do you know he's having a good laugh now? You can see it. <laughs> exactly. He'll be saying from up there, oh, you never found out my secret. <laughs> he was a lovely man. That's he was him. a lovely he was, yeah. I gotta be honest with you. I, I reckon Jillian's up to something like that. Well, yeah. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Jillian's married. Uh, yeah. That's what she says. But mind you, one Fred West married as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What the hell are we talking about? Right. Okay. Right. So next week, I look forward to seeing you guys next week. But Keith will be in the normal faith. Every what are we doing? Week. What are we doing next week? We're doing Cranogs. Cranogs, you said, didn't you? Oh, yeah. from from the from the uh, from the period before the Normans. So yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That sounds fine. All right then. Thank okay you. then. If there's no other questions from Keith or Goff, it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure today. And uh, Keith and Goff, I will see you next week. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, 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 bye you two. Bye. Thanks bye, for bye. that. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. He can't go. No, he can go. Everyone's still there. Are you still there, Keith? No, Keith, gone. Anyway, such such a bizarre lecture that was today. Whoever's watching there, thank you very much for watching. If you want to join us uh, live, we've got a live class that we teach as well at the same time. Um, I'm going to have to dash. I've got, um, well, I've got one of our little animals that has passed away today, so I've got to try and deal with what that problem is. And... Um, and I will be back. 
and uh, thank you very much. I'm going to end the live stream now.